testimony, but um, you know, I was in evangelism from 1973 to 75 when I first got out of Bible college and uh, really did a good job of starving to death. Uh, and then I was a youth director in church for uh, four years, pastored for five years. I tell people I got out on good behavior. And then um, and when the Lord uh, dealt with me about, uh, about leaving my pastor to go back into evangelism, uh, he dealt with me on a Sunday night. And so I told my wife, I said, uh, next Sunday, I'm resigning the church. We're going back into evangelism, and if God don't take care of us, we're going to starve to death. And that was just a plan, which is a really easy plan to live down to. And, uh, and Tuesday, I can still remember Tuesday, that Tuesday, I haven't told anybody, just God and my wife and I know I'm leaving next Sunday, or, past, or, or resigning. We stayed for another month. And, um, and I went to the altar in my church, because, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm at the altar, and I'm crying. And the reason I was crying is not because I was leaving the church, because I was already resolved to do that, but because I had to take it out of my heart. I am not allowed to love that church. I don't, that, that church is now Dave Dunbar's church. I don't even call it my, my church. It was his. It's his now. Uh, and so I had to take something that I loved out of my heart, and I'm on my knees, and I said, Lord, I said, now look, I'm going to resign Sunday. It's not a problem. This is not, this is not questionable. I'm going to do what I told you I want to do. I'm going to resign Sunday, go back into evangelism. But I said, for me, just for me, if you would, uh, if you want me back in evangelism, would you just have somebody call today and ask for a meeting? And, um, uh, and so I got done praying that prayer and um, went back in my office. And half an hour later, I got a phone call from an old friend by the name of Tom Benson. And he said, brother, this July, uh, next July, 87, I'm starting a camp meeting. Would you come and preach for it? And I said, hey, Tom, I said, did God ever use you for anything? He said, well, I don't know, brother. <laughs> I said, well, he did today, and I told him what happened. So, uh, so that was, uh, this was very, uh, very big. Yeah, that week, that week, and I never sought meetings when I pastored, but that week, five guys called uh, and, uh, and asked for meetings. In fact, that's the only five that have ever called. <laughs> okay. Uh, open your Bibles. Open your Bibles uh, to John chapter 1. It is good to be saved, isn't it? Yes, it is, and it is um, good to be in church. Yes. Now, I am, uh, this is not, this is not uh, aimed at Brother Norton, but I am a Yankee. Uh, what does that mean? That means <laughs> winning side. But, um, you know, everybody has, a, everybody has a preaching style. I knew a guy who preached 20 minutes by the clock, and, and, and I used to watch him. He would wind up. He'd start talking slow, and then he'd get more excited, and he'd... And then so he'd start talking, and you could watch about four, he'd do that, like five minute cycles, four of those, and he was done. And that was his style. Uh, and, um, and I say this about the South, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I, I tell people that the South hits the Bible like a, like a smooth stone on the lake, Bing! never to return again. Uh, you know, for that preach, I tell people, I said, the greatest sermon text in the Bible is John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. You say, why? Because you can preach anything you want. I mean, you get up Sunday and preach, uh, uh, Jesus wept because you didn't tithe enough. And I can preach an hour and tithe because Jesus wept. Because that's why he wept because you didn't tithe. Uh, he wept because you didn't win enough souls. He wept because you didn't do this. He, uh, it, you can just get him in on everything. Uh, I tend to give a lot of scripture when I preach. Uh, and and uh, I'm not homiletical. You know, all the letters, uh, all the letters, uh, the first letter of all the points start with the same letter. And when I teach preachers, uh, I tell them, I said, you need to preach something that's not your style. I understand that we all have a style, and God, uh, God will use that style. I don't even say he picks us because of our style, but he will naturally use that. But here's the problem. If you say, well, that's not my style, then God is going to not get some things. You're going to exalt yourself to the point where, you know, God called me, this is how I am. Uh, and so I preach some messages, so as much as I use a lot. I got one message, got 36 points. 36 scripture, aren't you glad for a, for a small price? I will not preach that here. Actually, for a large price. But, um, uh, I, you know, so I tend to a lot of scripture. So, for that reason, I have some sermons that just <clears throat> hit the Bible one time and never return. Uh, you say, why? Because you need to preach something that's not your style. Uh, and the one I'm preaching this morning is not my style because all of the points start with the same letter. All Seventy-five points start with the same letter. Anyway, no, it's twenty-six points. It's each letter of the alphabet. But um, 
Uh, no, I'm gonna, uh, so, so this is not my style, but it's just, uh, it's something I was reading. Guys, you ought to read that book and read that book and read that book, and I'm telling you, it is new every day. It really is such a, it's not a good book. No, the Bible's not a good book. It is the good book. It is not a good book on a list of good books. It is on a list all by itself. It is the only book as it is, okay? Uh, and so uh, I was uh, looking at my Bible one day, <clears throat> and I just noticed, uh, of course, the Lord is always there, but I noticed the word L. And so, uh, so I'm just going to talk to you, and it really is only uh, five points, and, and I already gave you one of them, believe it or not. But um, uh, I'm just going to talk to you about uh, words that start in L, uh, that are in the Gospel of John that describe our Lord. Uh, it says this, verse 6, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. There was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, it's always good to be in church. God, there are people here, they, they, make a, they make a bum decision, they go to the restaurant, order the wrong meal, they get in the wrong line at Walmart, uh, they pick the wrong size, uh, they, they just, you know, they just tend to make a bad decision, but God, every time they walk through the door of a church, they've made the right decision. That is always a good decision, not because I am preaching, not because anybody else is, just when they go to church, God, it's always a good thing to do. And so, Father, every person here can know this, that they are where you want them to be. And, Lord God, that is so important. But now that, that puts a lot on me because that means that you've got them where you want them. Now, you need to get me out of the way so they can hear from you. Because if all they get is me, God, they got cheated. They don't want to be cheated. They want something from you. God, you know all the things <clears throat> that would prevent your message from being delivered today. And please, God, uh, take Sam Gipp and get him out of the sight of these people and speak to their hearts for thee. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Uh, the Bible says this, uh, that John, verse 8, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Hey, guys, Jesus is the light of the world, is he not? You know, you know we say that so, so uh, frequently, but I think we don't really think about it. But, but he is the light of the world. Uh, take a look at chapter 8. Chapter 8. And verse 12, here's where he says that He says this, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I was reading a, a story last night. I was doing some research on a Next Fight On book. I was reading about a lady who was a, uh, she was a Brit. Uh, she was a spy. Uh, behind German lines, and uh, boy, I'm telling you, you, you wouldn't believe what some of these women uh, experienced, and uh, uh, she was uh, arrested by the Germans, uh, tortured horrendously, um, literally tore all of her toenails out, and, and uh, uh, burned her with a hot poker, and sundry other things. Uh, she spent, um, I think it was 10 months in solitary confinement, 10 weeks of that was with no light whatsoever. Uh, when you have no light, you remember what it says in, in uh, Exodus, a darkness that could be felt? Guys, you know, it gets dark. If you're ever in the woods at night and there's no light getting through, you can feel that darkness. But could you imagine being in a room where you literally can't see anything, totally uh, disoriented, uh, and this lady was in this room for, I think, 10 weeks, uh, with no light whatsoever. And you can guarantee you, it was darkness that could be felt. Guys, this world has had some times in its history when you could feel the darkness. I think Genesis chapter 7 and everything that the world was like uh, prior to the flood, uh, it was darkness that could be felt. Uh, I see us heading into that. Remember the Bible talks, or not the Bible, history, history talks about the dark ages? They were dark ages. You know, if you think about this, every other religious leader is basically a spiritual dark hole, black hole. Uh, Islam, when it comes in, darkness is left behind it, is it not? I mean, when it comes in and takes over, it pushes the light out and brings in darkness. You say, yeah, that's those Muslims. Well, so same thing with the Catholics, that's how the Dark Ages got here. Roman Catholic Church is no different than that. 
Uh, the Nazis and, and, uh, and uh, World War II, they did the same thing. The communists brought in great spiritual darkness with them, did they not? You know, I was, uh, I was reading a testimony one time, and there was a, uh, a Christian in Russia. Uh, it was a woman, and, and she was saved and scared to death to witness to anybody. And she said, uh, she was standing at a bus stop and saw this guy, and she'd see him several times, and the Lord kept saying, witness her, witness her. Uh, witnessed him, witnessed him. And she said, if I witnessed him, I'm, I'm going to end up in prison. And, and the Lord just kept doing it. And so she one, one day at the bus stop, before the bus got there, just two of them, and she started witnessing to him, said something about God, and, and she, he said, who is God? You understand that today we have, we have teenagers that have never heard the name Jesus, don't understand who he is? In this country, it used to be in heathen nations, somebody said Jesus, say, scratch their head, said, who is that? They're saying that now in this country, because we are now a heathen nation. And this guy said, so who is God? And she said, he is the creator of the universe. He is the one that made all of us. And this guy, his face lit up and said, I have been looking for him. She said, you have? He said, yes, I am a scientist. And he, he said, you know what convinced him? His thumb. He said, the chimpanzees, their thumb is, is hinged backwards. We have an opposed thumb. And he said, they can't do what we can do. And he said, there's no way this could have evolved. And I knew somebody had to make it. And the guy got saved. <laughs> I mean, came out of darkness. Some of you remember the darkness that you were in? We remember the darkness. Mormonism, it brings in darkness. Jehovah's Witnesses, it brings in darkness. Actually, religion in general will bring in darkness. Okay? Any religion without God to the extreme brings in darkness. And you know what he is? He's the light. Man, I remember this. Take a look. Uh, keep your place here. But uh, go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And Isaiah chapter 9, I'll begin to read verse 2. It says this, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Well, we'd stop there and preach. I remember walking in darkness. Do you remember walking in darkness? Do you remember when you were glad... When the sun was going down, because everything you were going to do, you wanted to do in the dark. Right. You know, one of the greatest differences between lost and saved, when I was lost, it couldn't get dark soon enough and stay dark long enough. Because everything I wanted to do, I wanted the lights out for. And after I got saved, I don't like the darkness. Yeah. I don't mean I'm scared of the darkness. I don't mean that. I mean, I like the light. Well, one of the best things, I go to preach for Nick Serino in, in like August and July uh, up above the Arctic Circle, and it's 24 hours of daylight. Now, I will work myself to death, because I'll just stay up as long as it's daylight. But I like that where the sun just kind of, here's the horizon, uh, and the sun just kind of goes, just, just about glances off the horizon, goes back up, stays day, 24 hours. I like that, okay? And um, it says, the people who have walked, that walked in darkness have seen great light. Some of you. Some of you, the reason you sought God is because you knew no matter what you had in religion, no matter what you, good thing you said you were doing, no matter how your life was and how much money you had and how much fun you were having, you knew you were in darkness. You knew it. You knew there was darkness. The people that walked in darkness have seen great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Guys, that, that is something to rejoice about, is it not? You know why you are here? Because the light, uh, you've been, you dwelt in the shadow of death and the light has shine, shone on you. Is that not true? Yes, Thou hast multiplied the nations and not increased the joy, thy joy. Uh, they, they, they joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And, and his men rejoice when the, they divide the spoil. Uh, for thou hast broken the yoke of his burden. And the staff of his shoulder, the rod of, the, of his oppressor, uh, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior uh, is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. Uh, but this shall be burning. Uh, uh, shall be burning and uh, fire, a uh, fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us, unto us a son is given. Uh, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hey guys, I'm going to tell you why you're here. Because of the light of the world. Now you, now you can say, well, I'm here because somebody knocked on the door, invited me. You say, well, I'm here because my, my parents drug me here since as long as I can remember. Somebody else can say, I am here because somebody at work told me I ought to give it a try. Uh, somebody could say, I'm here because I was driving by, looking for a church, just thought I'd stop in. I don't know why you're here, but I'm going to tell you why you're here. You're here because of the light of the world. And Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Guys, look what it says in uh, John chapter 12. 
John chapter 12. In verse 36, while you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed uh, and did hide himself from them. Guys, we are supposed to be, uh, it says here, uh, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. We're supposed to be, what do you say in Matthew chapter 6, the light of the world. We're supposed to be a light. We are the children of light. That is what is supposed to be different about us. We're supposed to have some light. You know, I could, it'd be hard to do because of a parking lot, but if you did this, uh, if you just um, uh, walked out here, nobody's going to bother that parking lot all day for, uh, for the next two days. Walk out in the middle of that parking lot, uh, take a long extension cord, uh, get you a little table lamp, just a little one, take the, the, the uh, shade off of it, uh, go to an Indian-run motel and get a 10-watt light bulb, and go in the middle of that parking lot at noon tomorrow. Now, I want, I'm looking at the weather, and it, uh, rain was yesterday, and it's supposed to be sunny uh, every day. So it's going to be bright and sunny. And you go out at noon and, and put that little 10-watt light bulb in the middle of that parking lot and turn it on. And guys will drive back and forth past this church all day long. They won't even notice it. Right? right. Will they notice it 12 hours later? Okay. They'll notice it at midnight, won't they? Did it get brighter? It's still 10 watts, isn't it? So what happened? It got darker around it. Is that not true? I get this from people because they don't think. Uh, and they say this, well, you know, this is a hard time to live for God. Guys, this is the easiest time there has ever been. You say, how do you know? When you get up in the morning, just don't dye your hair orange. <laughs> don't put a milk bottle cap in your earlobe. Don't put your tie tack in your tongue. See how simple this is? It really is. Uh, don't show us this much of your underwear. That's how simple it is. This is the, you know what? As it gets darker and darker and darker, all you've got to do is have light and the world will know. You know, one of my complaints about the great Y2K terrorist scare that was perpetrated by the greatest terrorist organization in the world, the news media, um, one of my complaints about that was our reaction to it. And our reaction to it was just like the lost world. I, I'd come into churches and guys go, you ready for Y2K? I go, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? And they tell me, you know, I mean, these guys had a, had a bunker up in the woods and uh, three years supply of food and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. And, and, and uh, here's the sad thing. And they, go, and they call it the Joseph principle. Hey, they would have shot a brother or sister in Christ that came and asked for a piece of bread. I don't remember Joseph doing that. And here was my problem during that time. During that time, we acted just like the lost people. And here's what I mean. Some lost, lost guy watched this TV special about Y2K. You know what's going to happen? Uh, January 1st, 2000, the computers are going to crash. The power was going to go out. Water was not going to be available. There were going to be food riots. All computers were going to crash. The Russians were going to fire their missiles. Your mother-in-law was going to move in. I mean, every horrible tragedy that could happen in the world was going to happen on January 1st, 2000. And so some lost guy heard that, and he went to work, and he thought, oh, yeah, there's a Christian at work. I'll ask him what I should do. And he said, man, did you hear what's going to happen? What should I do? Uh, and the guy said, well, I can tell you where to get some good freeze-dried food. That was our hope. You say, oh, it wasn't like that. It was like that everywhere. It w I, saw, <laughs> I saw a picture of a guy. He was so ready for Y2K. I saw a picture in his, his local newspaper of him standing in his basement. He had, he had shelves like a grocery store full of food. And he's, and he's kind of like, I ain't ready for YDK, you're not. And as I'm looking at this picture, I'm thinking, do you have any idea how many people have that picture posted next to their, their, their rifle? I mean, I know where most of the people in this city are going to be on January 2nd. I mean, guys, guys, if you were ready, why would you run around to, I am ready, I, I saw this guy, this guy put out a letter, uh, and he said, here's what you have to have for Y2K. And he did everything by 55-gallon drums. He said, you have to have 55-gallon drums of flour, 55-gallon drum of, of uh, sugar, a 55-gallon drum of toilet paper, which somehow seemed to epitomize this whole movement, and I, no pun intended. But, um, uh, uh, and, and, and it was 55-gallon drum of this, and I'm thinking, my goodness, do you know how much space this is going to take up? And he knew it. He says, now, if you don't have enough space... And you don't have a place to put it, I'll let you put up a storage building on my property. Now, I had a little larceny in my heart before I got saved. And I'm thinking, I'm going to put my stuff in a building on your property. 
And he goes, but don't worry, because you can lock it up and you keep the key. Oh, well, right there. I mean, I feel so much better. And I see all these people showing up on January, January 2nd, and him and his, all of his sons with their guns going, you're not coming on our property. But then my storage building's on there. It's on my property. I have the key. I mean, come on, guys. Have you not seen enough cop movies to know how to get a door open with a shotgun? Guys, guys, you know what that was? That was darkness. All, what would have happened? What would have happened if somebody would have went to their neighbor, the, uh, a lost guy would have gone to his neighbor saying, uh, what are we going to do when Y2K comes? And a Christian would have said, well, I'm just trusting the Lord to take care of me. It would have been different, wouldn't it? You know, I got to tell you something, guys. Uh, the liberals, the Democrats, they're not my hope. I got to tell you something, guys. The Republicans and conservatives, they're not my hope. If you think conservative politics are going to save this country, if you're not on drugs, get on drugs, because you need some reason to be so stupid. I am telling you that I don't have a leftist hope, and I don't have a rightist hope, and I don't have a liberal hope, and I don't have a conservative hope. You know what I have? A blessed hope. We are getting airlifted out. Guys, we should be a little bit different than this world. That world, that listen, the world is going to feel the darkness more and more. The lost world, the, the people in this country who are lost are seeing the darkness in our country, are they not? Then this is the time we have to be the children of the light. Yep. This is the time we don't have to act like the world. We don't have to say, well, well I'll just get my gun and shoot him. That is not the answer. Do you, I think you ought to have a gun? Yeah. Two reasons. Get food, keep food. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the horse is prepared against the day of battle, correct? But what's the rest of it? Safety is of the Lord. You know what that verse just told you? You don't go out to the farm, unhitch the plow horse, and say, I'm going to ride it into battle. Because the first time you squeeze a round off by that horse, he's going to throw you and run home. You prepare that horse. Do you ever go to an equestrian uh, display at a fair? And you'll see, there's a, there's a move that a horse does. Uh, he's, he's given a signal, a kick, whatever it is, by the rider. And the horse will leap in the air and kick his front feet out and his back feet out, literally four feet off the ground and go like this. That, that is a cavalry trained horse. And what happens is if this guy, first off, they take that horse and they, they fire a gun by its ears until it's not spooked by the sound of the gun. Prepared. Then they teach it that, so if this guy's about to be dehorsed, there's four or five guys about to pull him off the horse and are going to kill him. He hits that horse, it leaps in the air, does this, and then when it comes down, it was trained to take off at a dead run. So you could say, well, man, I'm going into battle with a well-trained horse. Yes, you should have a well-trained horse. But if you say this, I don't have to worry about going into battle because I have a well-trained horse. No, no, no. Safety's of the Lord. So yeah, yeah, you know, you want to have a gun? I don't have a problem with having a gun. But if you say this, I don't have to worry about anything because I have a gun. Oh, no, no, no. Safety is of the Lord. Guys, we need to be so different than this world. And as it gets darker, it should be so easy. So he said, I am the light of the world. Look at John chapter 1 again. John chapter 1. Verse 35, again the next day after, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Now I am sure you've seen what I'm going to show you, but I like showing it, and maybe somebody here hasn't, so act like you never saw this before. Uh, go to Exodus chapter 12. And I'll show you something that's precious from your Bible, and precious only in a King James Bible. In, in Exodus chapter 12, um, the, there's never been a Passover. Never been a Passover because that, that has never taken place, but it's about to. For the first time, for the only time in history, the Lord is going to pass over Egypt. He's going to kill all the firstborn, and he's going to give Israel a way that they don't have to lose their firstborn. Look what he says in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto, all, speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, uh, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, uh, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your account 
for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Uh, he shall take it out, of, uh, out from the sheep or from the goats. Guys, you know what was required? Now look, there are Old Testament sacrifices where it could be a bullock, where it could be a goat, where it could be a turtle dove, where it could be any number of things, where it could be a lamb, correct? This one is specific, lamb only, nothing else. In fact, I don't know if you ever thought about this, guys. If you were a farmer or a shepherd and you had sheep and you have this one and you can tell, I mean, right out of the gate, this is going to be the one. This is going to be a strong male. He's healthy. He's well. He's going to sire many. He is going to double your flock. This is your retirement. This guy is going to make you just not wealthy, but he's going to take care of you. That's the one. That's why it's called a sacrifice, guys. I wouldn't doubt some of those guys were crying as they carried this lamb, thinking, this is my future. This is my kid's future. This was going to increase my flock. I, this one would have doubled my flock. And, and I've got to kill it. Yeah, that's right. You've got to sacrifice. You say, well, that's not fair. Aren't you glad it isn't your son? Yeah. Don't you ever say God doesn't know what it's like. No, God didn't, God didn't kill a lamb. He killed his only begotten son. I think it's a little bit tougher. You understand? And when that man did that, do you understand that when he offered that lamb... He probably never had the monetary success that he would have if he did not. He took, it was a sacrifice. He lost something. And so God says, it's got to be a lamb. But here's the, here's the neat thing about your King James Bible. Look at verse 3. And it says, uh, in the tenth day of this month, uh, they shall take to every man a lamb. You know why? Because it has to be a lamb, doesn't it? It can't be a goat here. It can't be a, a turtle dove. It can't be a, a bullock. It can't be anything else. It's got to be a lamb, right? So it's a lamb. But look at the end. Uh, look at uh, verse 4. Uh, and if the household be too, too little for the lamb. It just went from a lamb to the lamb. You say, why? Because John explained that when, he just, when we just read in John chapter 1, verse 36. We said, behold, a lamb of God, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In case you didn't know what the lamb was, say, I need a lamb. There's the lamb. I, I was with a pastor not long ago, and he had a, uh, he had a uh, uh, his, his son is working in New York City. He's a, a, an iron worker. And he's taking this lost guy home, and he's talking to him and witnessing to him. Uh, and he started telling about the Jewish uh, practice of having to sacrifice a lamb to get rid of your sins. And, and he's talking about this innocent lamb that never did anything and how it's being uh, killed, losing its life. And this guy goes... That's not fair. That lamb didn't do anything. And then he took him to John chapter 1. And he showed him Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. And he looked over and he went, I got it. <laughs> and he got saved that night. Man, he went home and trusted Christ as personal Savior. You say, why? Because you need a lamb? No, no, no. You need the lamb. Guys, we, you, could, you could go out and get a lamb. If there was somehow a shepherd here and you, had, you could go out and get the best one you got, or if you're not a shepherd, you could, you could go spend your money and get a lamb of the first year without spot or blemish. And I'm telling you, it'd still be a lamb. You could, you could sacrifice it just as the Old Testament told it had to be sacrificed. You know what to do? You know what you'd have? A dead lamb. You would have one sin forgiven. Isn't that right? Because it's not the lamb. But what good is the lamb if he doesn't do this? Verse Five, your lamb. You know what the problem is right now? The problem right now is between thee and your. There is a world out there, we tell them Jesus is the lamb. And that doesn't do a bit of good until he is your lamb. Until they make him their lamb. Guys, he was the lamb for 20 years before he became my lamb. When you got saved, you know what happened? He went from being the lamb to your lamb. You know why you're here today? Because Not because he's the lamb. You're here why? Because he's your lamb. Isn't that good? Yeah. Guys, guys. <clears throat> he is the light of the world. He is the lamb of God. Uh, go, we'll just be brief here because I, I showed you this in um, Sunday school. But go to John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6 verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna uh, in the wilderness and are dead. Uh, this is the bread which uh, cometh down from heaven, uh, that a man may eat thereof <clears throat> and, and not die. I am the living bread. Jesus Christ is the living bread. Now, I am not, uh, I am not a bread uh, connoisseur, okay? Panera doesn't do anything for me, sorry. Um, and and I, know, I know that our bread is it's like eating styrofoam. And uh, if you eat it, probably, it's probably your 
probably worse for it than if you, that you don't. I know all of the arguments about bread. Uh, I, I kind of like bread. I don't have to have bread. Now, I will say this. I like some good Italian bread, and, and I like that, and um, uh, sometimes some good French bread, but, but it's not always that good. Sometimes, you ever get bread that was uh, advertised and it wasn't as good as it was advertised? That does happen, does it not? But you know what? He is the living bread. Um, you can eat bread and you will die. I, mean, I don't know if you ever thought about this, guys. You hear people, uh, they say, uh, oh, they put him on bread and water. Bread and water. He's being punished. No, he's being kept alive. I will say this for Bible days. Probably their bread was far more nutritious than ours, don't you think? And so when a guy was given bread and water, you know what he was given? He was given what he needed to live. If they wanted him to starve, they didn't give him the bread. And so the Lord is the bread of life. Guys, you know what you did? You did the same thing I did. We partook of this bread one day and haven't been hungry since. What I was looking for <clears throat> on the morning of June 14th, 1970, I haven't looked for in 45 years. You say, why? I got a bite of that bread and it, it took care of everything I needed. So guys, <clears throat> he is the, uh, the light of the world. He is the Lamb of God. He is the living bread. Chapter 14. In chapter 14, he says this in verse 6. Jesus saith to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the life. He is not a life. He is the life. You know, uh, it's funny. You ever hear people say this? Well, we're all going to the same place. We're just going different ways. I believe that. They're all going to hell. They're just all going different ways. Isn't that right? Some are going to hell as a Mormon, and some are going to hell as a Catholic, and some are going to hell as atheists, and some are going to hell as Baptists. Is that not true? Yeah. Yeah, they're all going, you know, oh, they think they're going to heaven all different ways. No, there's only one way. I like what Doc has a bumper sticker. If you could earn it, why do you have to die? I asked a guy one time, uh, I said, if, if, if you can live good enough to get to heaven, why did Jesus Christ have to be crucified? And he said this like he had good sense. He went, as an example. I said, you're going to follow it? I've never found anybody that thought that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was an example that ever said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go be crucified. Even some of the Filipino Catholics will try that. Come Easter time, they allow themselves to be crucified. Some of those people die because they're trying to be like Jesus Christ. And if they do, could you imagine, could you imagine the, um, the, the devoutness of somebody that would allow themselves to be crucified and die and go to hell? That's sad. You know what the problem is? He's the life. So what do you mean? Here's exactly what I mean. All right, question. No trick, question. You saved? Okay, you're saved. If I ask you, how did you get saved? And you explain it. Now again, the circumstances can be vastly different. Can they not? Oh, I was in the military. I was in, I was in the Vietnam War. I was in Grenada. Or I was over in the, uh, uh, the uh, Gulf Wars. And uh, uh, I got saved over there. Uh, I trusted Christ. Or uh, I got saved here in the Sunday school class when I was, uh, you know, six years, seven years old. Uh, I got saved when I was in jail. I got saved because somebody knocked on my door and led me to Christ. I got saved because a guy at work. I got saved because my husband and my wife led me to Christ. The circumstances can be the same, or can be different, right? Yeah. In fact, I wouldn't doubt many of our testimonies. Uh, I love testimonies because you hear the different circumstances of salvation. Not the different ways of salvation, the different circumstances. But now listen very carefully. You say you're saved. If I ask you, how did you get saved? If you can explain your salvation without mentioning Jesus Christ, you are not saved. It is that simple. You know, people go, oh, I just trust him. Okay. If you, can, if you can explain how you're saved without, without mentioning Jesus Christ, and that's real. Well, I think an example. No, 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 that's hedging. If you say, well, you know, I've always been in church. Oh, I didn't hear Jesus Christ mentioned there. Well, I got baptized. Guys, guys, I've told you before, that water does not fireproof you. That just means like a drop of water on a hot skillet, you're going to sizzle for a while when you go to hell. That's all. There's a place in hell for Baptists. That's probably over here all by itself, because even there they won't fellowship with anybody else. But, um, guys, uh, you know what I hate? I, if I could feel, now, now come on, I think all of us have this secret that if, if we could exempt one group 
and allow works for salvation. You know who I'd let in? The soldiers. How many times you see a guy wearing a jacket on the back and picture of Vietnam and it says, I'll go to heaven when I die because I already spent my time in hell. You know, somebody said war is hell. I've not been in war, but I can imagine what it's like. I, uh, just a little bit, I can imagine, but it's not the same. I mean, one minute you're talking to another guy, the next minute his head is in your lap. I mean, off his body. Guys, war is hell. You can understand. And, and, and when I see some of those guys that have done such, such brave things and died and went to hell because they're not going to heaven when they die because they didn't spend their time in hell. They spent some time in war. I'm sorry for the war. I'm sorry for the horror. I'm sorry for the death. I'm sorry for, for what it did to you physically or emotionally. I am sorry for that. But you are not getting to heaven but through Jesus Christ. And whatever you say, well, my, I'm just a good person. Hey, guys, come on. I know the Bible says there's none good. I know that. I always say this, there's none good, but there's some nice. Haven't you ever met a nice person? Let me ask you, have you ever met a lost Roman Catholic who loved God? Buddy, I have met some Roman Catholics that love God. You say, well, they'll get in, won't they? Nope. Nope. Because they're still trusting their priest. They're still trusting uh, whatever hocus pocus goes on in their religion. No, I am sorry. You are not getting to heaven by, but by Jesus Christ. And if you say, well, yeah, Christ, but also, that also threw it out. That also disqualified it. Guys, you're going to heaven through Jesus Christ or you're not gone. You know what he said? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He said that. I didn't say that. You want to argue? Argue with him. Did you ever stop and think about this? I, I, I might have told you this, but have you ever been told this by a lost guy? Oh, you Baptist, you think you're the only ones gone to heaven. You ever hear, anybody ever been told that? Did you ever stop and think about this? We're the only ones that don't think we're the only ones? Don't Catholics believe that you've got to be a Catholic to get to heaven? Don't the Muslims believe you've got to be a Muslim to get to heaven? Don't the Mormons believe you've got to be a Mormon to get to heaven? Don't Jehovah's Witnesses believe you've got to be a Jehovah's Witness to go wherever Jehovah's Witnesses go? <laughs> we are the only ones. I'll bet you have told somebody when you were witnessing to them, you trust Jesus Christ, you don't ever have to be a Baptist, but if you trust Christ, you'll still go to heaven. Isn't that true? I have told people that. All right, guys, guys, we don't tell them they've got to be a Baptist because being Baptist won't get them to heaven. Jesus Christ will get them to heaven. And nothing else. And nothing added. I got news for you, bucko. If, you know, well, you know, that was a good start. The cross was a good start. And you're going to finish it off? you got to add something to that. What? It was deficient in some way? So you had to have a house fire? Uh, you have to have a, a, a physical problem, you know, for, to, to pay for your sin? Something on the cross it wasn't taken care of? Pal, it's him or nothing. And it's him and nothing. And if you're trusting Jesus Christ today, you're trusting Jesus Christ. And you're not trusting anything else. And the world hates that. John chapter 21. I don't do well over the phone. I... I I, uh, I got a modern phone, you know. It's not a smartphone. That's a smartphone. You ever hear have people say, my, my smartphone is smarter than me. I'm smarter than my smartphone. I am. I know I am. I have turned it on, and it'll say, you are 25 miles from home. I don't have a home. Stupid phone. <laughs> See, I know I don't have a home. Stupid phone doesn't know. I'm smarter than my smartphone. You know what I can't get over? People that text that think I'm clairvoyant. I, I will get this. I'm, I look, I want you to pray for me, okay? And they'll go, uh, praying for you. And so I'll tell Kathy, well, area code 205 is praying for me. Yeah. <laughs> I had a guy one time, uh, about 10 o'clock at night, I get a call, uh, I get a text. Hi. That's really not a good way to start, pal. I ignored it. I get another one. How are you doing? I wrote back. Uh, I'm reading my Bible. And he starts, and I, he starts asking a bunch of questions. I said, do you have a name? Now, let me ask you a question. Does anybody here not know how to answer that question? If I say, do you have a name? 
You're going to say yes. Well, I said, do you have a name? He writes back, well, that's kind of a tough one. Pal, if giving your name's a tough one, you and I ain't having a conversation, okay? I mean, I, I would know you in any restaurant. You're the one they don't give any silverware to. I could pick you up. Nothing sharp in your hand, bucko. He goes, well, that's a tough one. He goes, and I, at that time, I didn't have texting. It was 20 cents every time. I said, listen, pal. I said, every text I send is 20 cents in wasted time. And I never heard from him. He said, you weren't being nice. I wasn't being nice. The guy texted me four times and couldn't tell me his name. You can't text somebody. Well, maybe he thought he was in your, in your phone. Don't tell me that. I never talked to him. He knew he wasn't in my phone. He doesn't have a brain. That's his problem. Guys, guys, I get this. Somebody called me and they go, how you doing? I go, who is this? Don't call me and not give me your name because this is going to be a short call. You say, well, that's not very nice. Guys, I have really got things to do and guessing games on the phone is not in the top of my list for the day. I am not, I, I've had guys say that. I, guy, I call, a guy called me and he starts talking. I said, who is this? He goes, guess. I said, I'm, yeah. I said, I'm not guessing. I said, you have 30 seconds to give me your name or I'm hanging up. And then I go, Tom Benson. Oh, Tom. <laughs> but there's just, there's just a few. There's just a few you can, you can tell by their voice. You ever just get somebody you can tell by their voice? I don't know that I have a distinctive voice. I don't know that you'd recognize me over the phone. But you know, they're just, hey there, preacher. Oh, yeah, I know who you are. Anyway, um, here's these failed fishermen. And, and the Lord has come back. He's, he's up from the grave. And these guys decide to go fishing. Wildest thing. And it says this in verse uh, 4. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. Now, first off, first off, I don't know about you. Men, if I was in a boat and some man on shore said, Children, I would think about rowing to shore. And it wouldn't be to say, want to come fish with us. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Now, don't you think right there, at least one of the apostles should have been the first person in history to say, deja vu. I've heard that before. Hadn't they heard it before? I mean, Peter, James, John, Andrew, those guys had. Maybe some of the others hadn't. But those other guys were fishermen out there, and three and a half years earlier, they were out all night long, empty nets, and some guy on the shore said, hey, guys catch anything? Oh, cast your, cast your nets on the right side of the ship. Said, yeah, okay, pal, you know how to do it. You're standing on shore. Whoa, look at this. And you'd think somebody would go. Yeah. They cast their four, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said unto Peter, it is the Lord. He got it, didn't he? He said, that's the Lord. You know what he is? He's the Lord. Amen. So what's that mean? That means that, that at his name, every knee is going to bow. Yeah. Every, every representative, every senator, every president, every Supreme Court justice, every king, every prime minister, every fascist dictator, Every communist dictator, you call them whatever you want to call them, king, whatever you want to call them, monarch, uh, call them the council, every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus is what? He is Lord. Guys, if you've heard it say, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. He is Lord of all, is he not? Guys, isn't that amazing? You know, if we just believed on a lamb, a lamb is just one out of a flock. But, we, but he's also the Lord. We get connected to the Lord. Did we not? And I just kind of like it because when that happened, at least one of them got it. Ah, I remember that. You know, I, I tell people, if I could change one thing about God, I'd do this. I would know there's nothing wrong with God, okay? There's nothing wrong with God. If I could change one thing about God, it would be this. We'd get rid of the still, small voice. I have heard that still, small voice and ignored it because isn't it easy to ignore Probably ought to slow down over this next hill. 
Woo, 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 woo. Oh, that was you. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I always say this. I think, I think God ought to speak with a bullhorn. Amen. You know, every now and then, God will say, <clears throat> probably ought to duck. I think I ought to say, duck! <laughs> you know, I was telling somebody the other day, the day I broke my neck, do you know that God warned me of it? The day I broke my neck, I saw a clear warning right in front of my eyes. I'm driving my boss's dump truck. We're hauling gravel out of a, out of a gravel pit. I pulled the dump truck up on the weights. I'm up, up on the scales. I'm, I'm at the weight uh, shanty. And there in the window, it shows a guy, a carpenter, falling backwards and saying, and it said, beware of falls. I mean, just as sure as I'm standing there, God directed my sight to that, to that poster. And I knew God did it. And you know what I said to God? Why are you telling me that when I'm driving a truck? This guy is working on a building, falling backwards, and I'm driving a truck. I can't fall like I did. I said, God, I, I can't fall like that out of this truck. And that morning I got done driving a truck, climbed up in the second story of a house, stepped backwards, fell that way and broke my neck. Boy, I wish God would have said, Hey, stupid! I'm serious. But did you ever hear this? Did you ever recognize the still small voice? There have just been a couple times. And, and you know what happens is, here's what I say. I, I go, oh, oh, there's, there's, there's that. I think, I think maybe I'm going to do this. And then I find out, and I go, it was the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just something in my head. It was the Lord. Yeah. Aren't you glad when you recognize him before the two by four upside the head? Before the speeding ticket, before the broken neck. Isn't it nice to recognize him? Haven't you ever had it in your life and you heard something you said, it's the Lord. Guys, he's the Lord. He will always be the Lord. You may disagree with him. Look, you are never, ever, always going to agree with God because we are not like him. We don't think like him. There is nothing wrong with disagreeing with God as long as you say this. I disagree with what's going on in my life right now, but you're right and I'm wrong. Yes, nothing wrong with saying, I, I, you know what I've told God? I don't understand why you're doing this. I, I know you're right and I still can't see why you're right. I still think my way is better. But don't worry. I've said this to God. I've said it in these words. I know who the idiot is in this picture. You say, you prayed that? Absolutely. I am the idiot. 100% of the time. 100 out of 100. He is the Lord. 100 out of 100. If you're sitting there right now, and the Lord has dealt with you about something, and you know what you're doing? You're going, well, I, I think it's the Lord, but I just don't see why. And I, I just, you know, I have to say, well, if God would explain to me. Oh, no, God's not going to explain it to you. No, sir, he's not going to explain it to you. I'll give you this and I'll be done. I led a good friend. He'd been my best friend in high school. I led him to the Lord years ago. And the Lord began to deal with him. I watched him. I watched him start coming to church and start reading his Bible. He had hair down over his shoulders. And one day he came to me. He got to 1 Corinthians. I never showed it to him. And it said, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And he said this to me. <clears throat> he said, well, I think if God wants me to cut my hair, he'll make me want to cut it. I said, oh, no, no, no. Now think about this, guys. I said, if God makes you want to cut it, then when you cut it, you're doing it for yourself. I said, if God wants you to cut your hair, he'll tell you to cut it. And you can look him right in the eye and say, I don't want to, but I'm going to do it for you. That's Lord. You know what's wrong with some of you? The Lord has told you to do something, and you're saying, well, yeah, but he's going to make me want to do it. No, no, no. He's going to tell you to do it. There's a whole bunch of people have gone to mission fields they did not want to go to. There's a whole bunch of people have done some things they did not want to do. You might have disagreed with him. What'd they say? You're the Lord. If he makes us want to do his will, then we're doing it because we, we, then we are God and we're doing it for ourselves. What was that stupid uh, smiling preacher in Texas? His wife got up and said, oh, don't come to God. Don't come to church for God. Come to church for yourself. I wouldn't go to that church for anybody. Well, I'm telling you guys, he's the Lord. He'll always be the Lord. You will not always agree with him. And every time you disagree with him, you will always be wrong, which to me, I find comfort in yeah. to know that there's no way I can be right even though I think my idea is better, even though I can't for the life of me understand why he wants done what he's done, but I know he's right, and that's all I have to know. He is the Lord. 
I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Let me ask you this morning, which, which one of these do you need to get in touch with? Do you need the light? Do you need some light in your life? Too much darkness? Maybe I'm talking to somebody, you need to come and trust the Lamb and make Him your Lamb. If you're here this morning, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You're here this morning, maybe you got religion, maybe you don't. Maybe you're Baptist, maybe you're something else, it doesn't matter. But you'd say this, Preacher, I believe that Jesus is the Lamb, but I'm not sure I've ever made Him my Lamb. Here is my hand to acknowledge that. Would you put it up? Anybody at all? I need to make Him my Lamb. Anyone? If you need the lamb, you come down here. Maybe you need the living bread. You know what some of you need to do? You need to make him your life. You know when a child is born, that's not the end of his life. That's the beginning of his life. And when you got saved, that was not the end of your life. That was the beginning of your life. And I say this. I don't understand the concept of trusting God with your soul, but not with your life. And it's the life that's the fun. It's the life that's rewarding. And maybe you need to make him the Lord. Maybe you're saying, I don't like what he's told me to do. Guys, I would be lying if I told you in 45 years, I've agreed with everything God had me to do. But he's been right every single time. So maybe somebody needs to come and say, okay, I call you my Lord, but I'll make you my Lord. I don't understand why you're doing this in my life. I don't understand why you want this. And my idea sounds better than yours. But you're right. I'm wrong. I'm the idiot. You're the Lord. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for being the Lord. Other people have a religion, and they, they have a prominent man in that religion. The Muslims have Muhammad. And the Roman Catholics look to the Pope, and and so many, God, so many. The Lutherans looked to Martin Luther. He was a great man. but They all have a man somewhere. And we don't have a man. John the Baptist is not our guy, God. You are the Lord. You're the Lamb of God. You are my Lamb. And I thank you for that. Maybe this morning somebody needs to come and just talk to you before they leave here and get distracted. Maybe somebody needs to come and say, Lord, I have not, I, have, I, I just need to apologize for my attitude about what you did. You're right and I'm wrong. Somebody would feel a lot better if they did that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, as piano plays. If you need to come and talk to the Lord, will you come? Lord, whatever you want. Can you say it? Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. I don't care if you say it this way. You're right, and I don't even know why you're right. And I still think my way seems better. But you're right, and I'm wrong. Say, what is that? That's Lord. Folks have come. If you need to come, you come. If you need to be saved, now's the time. Step out and come. Be glad to take a Bible and show you what God says that you already know in your heart is true. Now one has come this morning and said, hey, I wanna, I've been saved. I want to be obedient to the Lord in baptism. I'm, I need to get baptized. Thankful for the Sunday school lesson this morning that helped him to make that decision. Saved three weeks now willing to take that step of obedience. How about you? Maybe you've been saved and you've never been baptized. Why don't you come and say, you know what? I'm ready to walk through that door. You've known about the Lord in your mind. And you know a lot of facts about him, but you've never trusted him as your savior. Your savior. 
your lamb, your Lord. Just play through one more verse here. And if you need to come, now's the time. Step out and come. Get it settled today. Eternity is a long time to be wrong. Come to Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, the Savior of the world. Well, amen. You glad you came to church this morning? Sunday school was good, morning service was good, I've been blessed, and, and what a praise to the Lord just to be in church. All right, let's be dismissed in prayer, 6 o'clock tonight, and hope to see you back, and then 7 o'clock Monday through Friday. Brother Bert, can you dismiss us in prayer? Hey Amen. When you get home, make a phone call, go see your neighbor, and uh, invite him to come to church with you. Amen. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.